So I am very happy to welcome our next speaker, Giuseppe D'Angelo from KDAP, who is going to speak about integrating OpenGL with Qt, 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 Qt Quick 2 applications. Please give a warm welcome to Giuseppe. Hi. OK. OK, thank you, everybody, for being here this afternoon. I hope you have been enjoying the conference so far. So I'm the last thing you're going to see about this conference. Just kidding, just kidding. Yeah, OK. Uh, so uh, today I would like to talk with you a little bit uh, about how do we how we can integrate uh, OpenGL code with Qt Quick 2 applications. Uh, the bottom line of this talk uh, is this one. Uh, you got perhaps or a legacy code base of OpenGL code or even brand new OpenGL code uh, that you don't quite want to touch. You don't want to, to refactor it. And nonetheless, you want to use Qt Quick 2 as uh, where it shines, as a very good way of building 2D user interfaces. So how can we integrate the two together in order to augment your 3D rendering code that is done using OpenGL with a very solid 2D UI built using Qt Quick. And since Qt Quick itself is rendered using OpenGL, the two things actually go very well together. So uh, the things I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to the Qt Quick 2 renderer. We'll see how Qt Quick 2 renders the scene, how it works, how it functions. Yep. Uh, and then we're going to see basically three different ways through which I can achieve this integration between Qt Quick and OpenGL. Uh, the first way goes uh, about how can I realize uh, underlays and overlays, that is how can I render my OpenGL code below the Qt Quick 2 UI or on top, if you need that. Uh, the second way is about how can I create custom OpenGL-based items, so items that I can place in my Qt Quick scene anywhere I want, uh, they just become an, just one particular item in my scene. And the third way is about uh, getting more in control of the Qt Quick 2 rendering. Uh, there are a few situations in which we are not fine with the fact that Qt Quick 2 renders every time it wants and we don't have control over that. So if we want to achieve that kind of control, uh, that's, uh, that's that section. Uh, lastly, I've got a few extra bonus slides, just in case I've got enough time at the end and or we've got some questions about the Scene Graph API. Okay, so let's get started. Let me talk a little bit about uh, the Qt Quick 2 renderer. Uh, I'm assuming that since you're in this room, you already know a little bit about Qt Quick 2 and what it does. So it's basically a framework uh, to build the 2D user interfaces. Yeah, you build these scenes in this very nice language, QML. Yeah, it, uh, it comes with a lot of QML elements out of the box for building your 2D user interfaces. And uh, the nice part about it is that it is extensible using C++. So not only it's got bindings to C++ in the sense that you can expose C++ objects into the QML scene, uh, but also you can define new elements, new Qt, new Qt Quick elements from C++. And the nice part about this, about Qt Quick 2, is that uh, the rendering is based on OpenGL, as I just said. Uh, the idea is that uh, using OpenGL is basically good because you get a lot of smooth animations, special effects, uh, you name it. GPUs are very good at doing this stuff, so Qt Quick 2 uses that. So how does Qt Quick 2 exactly render a scene? Uh, the idea that uh, about the Qt Quick 2 uh, render is this one. Uh, Qt Quick 2 renders the contents of a scene graph. A scene graph is, if you want a bad word in 3D, but um, a scene graph is basically a data structure. It's a data structure that contains the visual representation of all your elements in a scene. So think about a 2D UI in which you've got buttons, images, sliders, you, whatever you want. Uh, the scene graph structure that corresponds to that 2D interface contains just the visual elements so the things that the render needs in order to visualize that scene. So basically, it's going to contain stuff like geometries, the shape of the elements, the materials, so what it look like, you know, transformations, clipping factors, all stuff that is just visual, OK? All the logic, all the other stuff is not in the scene graph data structure. It's outside. Yep. Uh, sorry, yeah, and the idea here is this. Uh, the idea is that the renderer can simply use this data structure in order to render a scene. It does not need to know what your 
you, what your scene actually does, only how, what it looks like. Uh, this is important uh, also because the rendering is actually multi-threaded. The rendering is multi-threaded on most platforms, I would say pretty much all platforms these days, unless you disable it. Uh, what does this mean? This means that basically uh, the OpenGL calls that are going to render the contents of your scene graph are going to be issued on a dedicated render thread, which is not going to be your GUI thread. Okay? Uh, this has two positive, uh, this has two advantages, so why it has been done that way. Uh, the idea is twofold. The first idea is that while the renderer is submitting work to the GPU, your main thread is free to go. You're free to update your logic, to do your business work there. You don't need to be stuck by the fact that you need to render your scene. Yep. And at the same time, the render thread is free to go in case you block your GUI thread. So if you accidentally do some kind of IO call and you need to be stuck for two seconds, your rendering is not going to be stuck because it runs in a separate thread. Yeah, so that's great. However, of course, as they say, uh, I've got a problem, I added threads and I've got two problems, or maybe three, or maybe zero. <laughs> Did you get that? No? Okay. The problem is that when you introduce thread, of course, you introduce a synchronization problem. Yep, there is, must be a step in which the main thread and the other thread communicate or synchronize, uh, and that step has to deal with building and updating this single data structure. Yep. So there are many ways of synchronizing threads. Uh, you can use any algorithm we want. In a cute quick, the, the synchronization between the main thread and the render thread happens in an explicit synchronization step. There is a moment in time during which one thread gets stopped, and the other thread gets the chance of updating its data structures, and then the other thread can continue. Yeah. So let's see that step. Let's see that detail about how we synchronize things. So uh, the synchronization happens this way, basically. Uh, an update gets requested somehow. Yeah, this can happen typically via APIs such as QQIC item update or QQIC window update, all right? So once there is an update that is needed, after some time, the synchronization happens, and the synchronization looks like this. The main thread, the GUI thread, gets stopped, and the render thread has a chance of walking over your scene and calling that QQIC item update paint node on all the items of your scene. Yeah, so it goes around and asks each, each and every item, uh, what is your visual representation? What is your visual representation? What is your visual representation? And gathering this data, it's basically building that scene graph data structure. Okay? After that it's done, then the GUI thread is unblocked, so it's free to continue with its business logic. And at this point in time, the render thread has everything it needs to render your scene. Right? It's just asked for all the visual information, so it's free to go. And what it does is basically it can analyze this scene graph structure, actually optimize it, which is very important, and start submitting work to the GPU in terms of OpenGL calls. Okay, so if you want a visual representation of all of this, it looks like this. You've got the render thread. Yep, at that point in time, on the right, the main thread gets stuck. The render thread asks for the item tree, doing this middle section here, the main thread is blocked, so nothing bad can happen. There is no need for locks or everything. The main thread is going to return some information. I'm going to explain in more detail what those nodes are, but basically those nodes contain visual information. And after, those, uh, after the data is returned, the main thread gets unlocked and it's free to go. And the render thread is also unlocked and free to go and can actually render the data structure. Right? So. What's good news in there? Uh, the good news is that while this, while this synchronization round happens, we actually get a bunch of signals emitted by Qt Quick that tell us exactly where we are in these synchronization steps. And we can use these signals to perform extra drawing using OpenGL. We can, know, we can leverage the fact that we know that this synchronization is happening to do work. So in particular, oh, sorry, all the pixels really, uh, sorry. There is this diagram uh, from the Qt documentation that tells us uh, how, so what's the more complete story from a code point of view. So again, the, the update starts with a Qt quick item update. Yeah, and this basically begins a new frame. And once the GUI thread gets blocked, the render thread will emit a signal called before synchronization. Yep. 
that synchronization is complete, and we've got another signal, which is called the before rendering, right? Then the Qt Quick actually renders itself, then I got another signal called after rendering, and then I got another signal called frame swapped. Yeah? I know exactly where my eye by listening to these signals. I can use them, actually, I'm going to use them in order to render OpenGL. So, let's do that. How do I, uh, sorry, let's do that by implementing uh, an OpenGL underlay, by drawing OpenGL, and I mean raw OpenGL, below Qt Quick. So how can we do that? Uh, these, are a few, these are a few of the signals that I just mentioned. I can listen to these signals, so before synchronizing, emitted before the synchronization, before rendering, emitted before Qt Quick itself starts rendering, after rendering, emitting after Qt Quick is rendered, frame swapped, emitted after I swap buffers, I can use these signals to know exactly what to do. And for instance, if I listen to this signal here before rendering, yep, so at that point in time, Qt Quick has not yet rendered itself. So I can go ahead and render my OpenGL code. Right there. Okay? And after I'm done, Qt Quick proceeds and draws itself. So what happens in practice is that first I draw OpenGL and then I draw Qt Quick on top. That's how I achieve an, uh, an underlay. Yeah. There are a few more extra signals that I might be interested in listening to. Uh, there are these other two which, are, which tell me about what's the status of the OpenGL context. So in particular, the first one tells me that I've got an OpenGL context. I can cr start creating uh, OpenGL resources. The second one tells me that uh, uh, the OpenGL context is going to be destroyed. So I'm supposed to free resources. Of course, this is just to make your code clean. And uh, yeah, so basically what I said is that we can connect to these signals, typically to a subset of these signals to implement overlays and underlays. This is a small catch. As I just mentioned, the rendering may be multi-threaded, which means that these signals are going to be emitted from a separate thread. And if you attended my talk yesterday, you may know that this, that means it's a cross-thread signal source connection. Uh, but we actually want that code to be invoked immediately, so I must force a direct connection type for these kind of invocations. Yeah? Uh, in the slots that I connect to these signals, I just do my custom OpenGL drawing code. So there should be a demo coming at this point, yes. So I just switch to some code. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. So here's some code. I hope, uh, can you all read that? I hope it's big enough, yeah, for most of you. So, okay. So in this code, okay, I'm not doing anything magic. I'm just creating uh, this my quick view class, showing it, and so I'm not doing really anything. So let me discuss what is this my quick view class. This my quick view is a very simple subclass of Q quick view, as you can see over here. I'm inerting from Q quick view. So this is a class which is able to host some Qt quick. And for simplicity, I'm not just going to make everything into this class. So what do I do in here? In here, I create this object called mRenderer, which is the object is the class that encapsulates my OpenGL code. That class here, th this is the class that basically I don't want to touch, and it's the class which is responsible for rendering 3D content. Okay? For me, it's a black box. I'm never going to interfere with it. I'm just going to tell it, please render yourself. Yeah, because I don't want to touch it. I also go hit a camera because I want to have a camera. I'm going to explain why in a second. So inside this code here, I perform basically a bunch of connect statements, connecting to all these signals coming from Qt Quick that I want to use in order to implement. In this case, it's an underlay. Yeah. So I want to know that when Qt Quick initializes the scene graph, because at that point I've got uh, an OpenGL context I can initialize myself. I want to know before Qt Quick is uh, sorry, I want to know when Qt Quick is about to be synchronized. So at this point in time, the main thread is stopped. I can do some synchronization. I, know, I want to know before Qt Quick itself renders, because I want to draw myself. And I want to know when the scene graph is invalidated, because at that point in time, after that point in time, I will lose my OpenGL context. So I need to do some cleanups. Yep. Those are the contacts that I need in order to implement all of this. Uh, let's see what the corresponding slots do. So in the initialize, I'm simply going to initialize my renderer. Yeah, that's just a black box. That's basically a call to say, 
you are now free to create your OpenGL resources. You've got an OpenGL context at this point in time, go ahead and do it. Yep. So let me go back. Um, I'll just keep this for a second. In the render one, I'm simply going to call render. Yeah, I don't know what this does exactly. It will render something on the screen. Uh, in invalidate, I'm going to invalidate it, which means free your OpenGL resources. There is nothing else to do. And there is something else here in this synchronize, which is uh, actually quite important. In the synchronized one, uh, so this slot gets called during the synchronization step, while the GUI thread is stopped, and the render thread has a chance of going in the main thread and fetching data. I'm actually doing that. I'm actually fetching data from this M camera object, which is a camera, and setting the corresponding properties on my renderer. Okay, this is safe to do because camera is an object which in general is being managed by the main thread. Yep. So I cannot touch it in the render thread, except when the synchronization itself is happening. So in this particular slot, I know for a fact that the main thread is stopped. I can go and fetch the properties from the main thread and copy them into the render thread if you want. Right? So that's exactly what I'm doing here. I cannot touch this M camera object from any other of these methods because these other functions may be called when both threads are running. So I, I, I risk a data race in that case. Yeah, I don't want that. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Let's see this in action, actually. Let me hope it works. Oh, it actually works, see? No applause? Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I've, that's great, right. So what I'm seeing here is this 3D mesh renderer, which just draws a tree falling knot. And over here, this is a cute quick interface that actually changes that camera object. Yep, so as you can see, I can pilot it very easily. As you can see, the cute quick UI is truly on top of the OpenGL content. They're not like two separate parts of the window. Yeah, you can see the translucent part on the bottom. Yep, it's just like that. So this is totally rendered on the, uh, below my cute quick content. Okay. So what else I do in this code? Well, I basically <coughs> do some other minor, minor things, such as every time the camera changes in any way, I trigger an update because of course I want to re-render myself because I need to re-render the 2D part. I set some other properties that I will explain in a second. And in the end, I just load a QML file. Yep. And the QML file doesn't do anything magic if I find it, the QML file simply has this camera controls, which is the small box in the bottom that shows three sliders to control the camera. I don't, don't, I don't need to do anything special in here. Okay, OpenGL is going to be rendered below it anyhow. Okay, so back here. Uh, let me explain a few things here and there. Uh, so everything is great, but there are uh, a few gotchas that you must be aware of. In particular, there are a few things that Qt Quick does by default that we don't like when we are implementing underlays or overlays. So the first thing that we don't like is that by default, the Qt Quick renderer clears the color buffer before it starts rendering itself, right? So it's a bit pointless if I render my stuff, then Qt Quick comes along and clears it. I hope you agree with that, but you can opt out from this default behavior by calling uh, this function set clear before rendering false. Okay, fair enough. Uh, the second thing that we must be aware of is that uh, the OpenGL context used by the renderer may be destroyed on certain occasions. Yeah, it, it might just disappear. Uh, so how do we cope with that? Uh, we cope with that by listening to the right signals coming from QQQ window, and those signals will tell us when the OpenGL context is about to be destroyed, and when that happens, I'm supposed to clear up all my resources. Then some time later, this OpenGL context may be recreated, in which case I can recreate my resources. Uh, there is this call that you may decide to use, which is called set persistent OpenGL context true. Uh, that call basically tells Qt, uh, try to keep the OpenGL context uh, for as long as you can. Yep. But nonetheless, in some occasions, it's not Qt that destroys the, open, the OpenGL context, but it's your operating system that does so. For instance, if you upgrade your OpenGL drivers. Yep. 
So that might just happen. Uh, don't over rely on this particular function that you call. Just be sure that you connect to the right signals and you clean up when, you, when Qt tells you the OpenGL context is about to die and you recreate it when you, when you get a new OpenGL context. You must just do that. Okay. What else, uh, what else uh, is there? Yeah. If you noticed in my code, uh, I had a few strange calls sprinkled around about to this function, reset OpenGL state. Uh, what is it all about? Well, it's about the fact that the Qt quick renderer uh, tracks what's your current OpenGL state, and in general, it does not expect you to modify it uh, under his nose. Yeah, it wants, it, it assumes somehow that the OpenGL context is as, as it left it before. However, when we run custom OpenGL code, we cannot just guarantee that in the general case. I cannot guarantee that I'm going to reset the state to exactly what it was before. So a way to do that in the general case is to just call this function. So every time you do some custom OpenGL calls, call this function to reset the state. And indeed, this is the stuff that I was doing in here. Every time I, I touched my renderer here, I also reset the state for Qt Quick. Yep. In here, in the render underlay, I render something, which means do some OpenGL calls and reset the state. Yep. So this is necessary, otherwise I will just see graphical glitches on the screen. Oh, sorry. Sorry, okay, there we go. The last thing is the thing that I insisted before is be very aware of the fact that the render is multi-threaded. Yep, so inside your functions, you are not supposed to touch anything from the main thread without the proper synchronization. Uh, the best way I've found to cope with this problem is actually do, uh, do exactly what Qt Quick does. In the synchronization step, copy out all the data from the main thread into the render thread. Copy the rendering data that you need. Okay, that makes you safe, basically, by definition. Uh, otherwise, you need to start adding locks everywhere, and that's kind of a tedious job because you may forget some code path, so I don't like that in general. It's much more robust to just copy out the rendering data that I need. Yep, and I can do that, again, this before synchronizing function. When that signal is emitted, I know for a fact that the main thread is stopped. I can safely access anything in the main thread because the main thread is not running at that point. Okay, so that's it about uh, OpenGL underlays and OpenGL overlays. Uh, let's go one step down and let's talk about creating custom OpenGL based items. So I, what I mean by that are items that I can put inside my Qt Quick scene. They're just peers, they're just something that I can place somewhere, I can answer, I can, I can do whatever I can do with the, any other built-in uh, Qt Quick item. So how can I create a custom item in Qt Quick? Uh, a custom item in Qt Quick is created by subclassing that class called Qt Quick item. That's the base class of all the visible elements inside Qt Quick, right? Uh, and basically inside that, inside that class, you will find a bunch of properties such as X, Y, Z, width, height, right? It's the base class. It will contain event handlers for input. It will contain all the answering system, et cetera. They're all in there in the base class. Okay, so the idea is, that, is this, that you can create a subclass of QQuick item. Yep, you can expose it to QML by using this function, QML register type. Oh, sorry, just jump slides. Using this function here, QML register slide, register type, sorry. And then how do I make this item render itself somehow? Well, the idea is the same. I can just re-implement, override, update paint node and that function is supposed to return all the scene graph data that that particular element needs to render itself. Okay? So that's the theory. After I've done so, I'm, I'm good. Then what I can do is go to QML and start creating instances whenever I need. Yep. By the way, this is exactly how built-in elements such as rectangle or image are implemented. Exactly like this. So, uh, I'm not going to exactly discuss this low-level API because this API, while fun, uh, it's not exactly what we want. What I want to do really is wrap existing OpenGL rendering code. I don't want to deal with all this complicated Qt Quick scene graph machinery because that requires touching my code and that's exactly what I don't want to do, right? I want to wrap my code, but I don't want to modify it. So for, for these kind of use cases, there is 
convenience. For this kind of use cases, there is exactly one class that does that suits for the job. And this class is called a Q quick. Oh God, what's going on? A Q quick frame buffer object. A Q, that class here, Q quick frame buffer object, is a Q quick item subclass. Yep. That provides for us the implementation of update pane node and deals with the complexities of the scene graph. What that class allows us to do is simply to wrap our rendering code, yeah, and made, make that rendering code basically uh, draw itself into off screen memory, into something that in OpenGL call a frame buffer object or FBO. So through, through that class, our code will render. Through an, uh, into off-screen memory, and then that class will basically take that contents and put them somewhere in our QtQuick scene. Yeah, without me writing all the necessary boilerplate. So how does this guy look like? Uh, so that's exactly that, QtQuick frame buffer object. Uh, in order to use that class, uh, things are slightly more complex, but may make sense. Uh, we need to create actually two subclasses, not one. Uh, in order to use this class, I will need to subclass both QQuick frame buffer object itself, but I also will need to subclass another class called QQuick frame buffer object renderer. Yep. And the idea of these two classes is basically they will mimic the main thread, render thread division of work. That's why I have two classes to subclass. So let's do that. Let's start by the renderer. I can subclass that QQuick frame buffer object renderer. That's an inner class, so I need to subclass it. And that subclass is the class that will actually deal with the rendering. Okay? So when I subclass that, I got just two pure functions that we need to override. The first, the first function that we need to override is this function called render. Yep. And that render function, inside that render function, I can render my custom OpenGL code, just as is. The second function that I need to override is this synchronize function. This synchronize function will be called during the synchronization step. And as an argument, I get the frame buffer object that basically is living in the main thread. So this is the chance that I get to copy data out again from the main thread object into my render thread object. Yeah, it always works like that. There is always some pull the data in while the GUI thread is stopped, so it's safe to do. Uh, the counterpart, the Q quick frame buffer object, that's the, that's the type that I'm going to subclass. I'm going to give this type an API, for instance, add the properties, add the signals, add the slots, and that's the type that I'm going to register and expose to QML. Okay, so there are two of them. The only thing I need to do inside Q quick frame buffer object is creating my render. So the way I do so is by overwriting that create render function. And inside that function, I will create an instance of my custom renderer, which is a subclass of the renderer sub subclass, and return it from there. So enough theory. Let's see this in practice once more. Where did creator go? Here. OK. So let's see this in practice. OK. Again, in main, I haven't got much. Actually, I've got something. In main, I will create a plain QQuick view and load some QML. And before doing that, I will register my frame buffer object type. So I'll come back to this in a second. Let's see this type first. So this my frame buffer object is one QQuick frame buffer object. It inherits from it. It has a few properties because it's got an API. I can do whatever I want in here. Yeah. And the only thing I really need to do is overriding this create render function over there. Line 37. Let me scroll it a little bit so you can see in the back. Yep. This is the only thing I really need to do because that function is a pure virtual. Everything else is API on top. Yep. So what does this function do? Well, it doesn't do much. I just return a new my customer render. End of the story. <laughs> yep. Okay. So how about the other subclass, the one I needed to create? Well, this is actually this class right here. This my frame buffer up object render is the subclass of the QQuick frame buffer object render class. Okay? Inside this class, I can do basically just a couple of things. Uh, when I construct it, I 
initialize my render, and if you're curious about what this is, this is again my custom rendering code that I don't want to touch. Yeah. So when I construct it, I initialize it. When I get asked to synchronize, this item here is the item that is living in the main thread, right? So what I can do is simply copy data out of it. I'm going to downcast it to my custom type, because I know it is, and I'm going to fetch data out of it. Again, copying data from the object living in the main thread into my object living in the render thread. And finally, in the render function, I'm going to call render on my custom OpenGL code. And I remember to call this reset OpenGL state because I'm touching OpenGL state. I don't want to do that. OK? All right. So there are a few extra things I may decide to do, such as customizing the frame buffer object, but that's kind of advanced. I'm not going there right now. The important part is that after I've done all this, I can go back to the main and register my frame buffer object type into the QML engine by calling that QML register type function. OK. So how does this all look like when it runs? Uh, no, thank you. Don't save. It looks like this. Do you see that? Now, this element is an element in, in the cute quick scene. I can, again, control its camera position. So that rotation is actually automatic. It's not be doing that. Yep. As you, know, as you may notice, there is some text which is anchored to the bottom of it, because now that element is just one element in the scene. I can use anchors with it. Why not? I can use mouse area over it. I can do whatever I want. That's just one. It's just like a rectangle, if you want. It's just an element. I can put it in my scene and do whatever I want with it. Yep. So let's see the QML code that renders all of this. Well, there is some code, horrible code, for the uh, animation part. But it basically boils down to this element right here. This mesh renderer is the element that I created in C++, exported from C++, and imported here in Qt Quick. So it's just one element that I create from QML. I can give it width, height, whatever, everything I want. Yep, I can take some text and anchor it to it. Anchor top, parent bottom, horizontal center, horizontal center. I can take a mouse area and put it over it. Yep. So I'm pretty much unlimited in what I can do. This element is now uh, one amongst every other, uh, is identical to any other cute quick atom. Okay, so that's how we implement elements that way. Uh, let me finish with like another more advanced topic, which is this. Uh, so far, uh, the rendering of my OpenGL code had been driven by Qt Quick itself. Qt Quick itself decided when I needed to render myself because it would just fire a signal, and at that moment in time, I need to render it. I cannot wait, I cannot think twice, okay? What if I want to be in charge of the rendering? What if I want to ask Cute quick, please render yourself right now. Don't tell me when to render. I want to invert the parts. So uh, for doing that, there is this class, which is called QQuick Render Control. That's the class that allows us to render, to control the rendering. Yep. OK. So for instance, uh, there are a few scenarios in which I may want to uh, control the rendering. There are a few examples there. Uh, example number one, I want to use a custom or already existing OpenGL context. This is very, very common in scenarios where we deal with a third-party library or third-party OpenGL engine, which just creates a context of its own, and I cannot use Qt Quick's own context. I need to adopt that one. Yep. Uh, I want to decide when, to hap when the synchronization happens. Perhaps I'm not fine with Qt Quick blocking the main thread whenever it wants. I want to decide when that should happen. Yep. Uh, I want to decide when Qt Quick itself withdraws and how. Perhaps I don't want it to draw on the screen. I want it to be redrawn into a texture, into a frame buffer object. So QQuick Render Control is the class that allows us to do all of this. Yep. It allows us to give all total control about everything in, uh, uh, when it comes to QQuick rendering. So how do I use it? Right, here we go. The way I use QQuick Render Control is, again, by using two classes together. The first class I need to use is a QQuick window, right? That's the good old QQuick window. It's the same thing that we no, would normally use, 
except that in this case, I just create it. So I create an instance of QWIC window that I'm never going to show or create. It's just a hidden window. It's there for legacy purposes. I'm, and I'm honest with you <laughs> about this. You just need to create one, okay? And then you need to create a QQuick render control, okay, over that window. The second thing I need to do is connecting to a few signals coming from QQuick render control, and I've got three or four slides about that. And the last thing really is I need to initialize QQuick render control, passing in an OpenGL context which is already created. Okay, so I get I basically decide exactly when and how create this OpenGL context, with which format. Perhaps it was already created by third-party library, so I just pass it in. I don't need to... Uh, if it's not already created, the problem is that I need to create it myself. So that's an extra step I need to take. And what are these signals? What are the signals that QQuicker control uh, emits? It will emit two or three different signals. The first one is called scene updated, and that is emitted every time Qt Quick wants to re-render itself. So what do I need to do in that case is, so when Qt Quick uh, re requests a redraw, I need to do three things, or actually two things. The first thing I need to call is this polish function. And the second thing I need to call is the sync function, which actually performs the synchronization, right? Now, depending on whether I want to run in a multi-threaded thing, so main thread, render thread, or whether everything runs from, the main, from one thread, because I may also decide to do that, uh, this function must be called by one specific thread. So polish must be called exclusively from the main thread, and sync must be called from the render thread. Of course, if the two collide, then just call one after the other in succession. Second, when uh, a render is requested, this signal gets emitted, render requested, in which case you are supposed to call render at your earliest convenience. You decide when exactly, but this is just telling you I need to render myself, and you decide when to render by calling render on it. Yep, so I got, I got a lot of flexibility, but also a lot of things to care about in this case. Finally, how do I, hand, how do I handle input? Uh, there is nothing in there that handles input for me. So how does a mouse click reach Qt Quick and does something in there? Uh, that's where that Qt Quick window that I created comes into play. That's why that, that's kind of hack. That Qt Quick window comes into play because all the events I want Qt Quick to receive, uh, I basically resend them to the window. So I can use Qt application send event we target the window, sending in the event I want Qt Quick to, to receive. Mouse events, keyboard events, anything. Yep, I need to send them manually. So again, let's see all of this in action. And be prepared. So what happens in this case is that I just got a, a window of mine. And inside this window, I need to do everything by hand. And by everything, I mean literally everything. I need to initialize a top-level window. This OpenGL window, this top-level window must be an OpenGL window. I need to create an OpenGL context. I need to initialize the render control with this OpenGL context. <coughs> lots and lots of things. So let's go one by one. So this first batch or lines are going to set up what's a uh, top-level window. If you take a look over here, this render window just inherits from Q window. So this is a plain top-level window. It doesn't do any magic. I need to perform the initialization myself. So the first thing I'm going to do is set it up as an OpenGL window, like that. Yep, so I set the surface type to be OpenGL. I create a surface format to describe which kind of OpenGL version I want. It's going to be 3.3 core profile and a certain number of bits for the depth, sensible, and multi-sample buffers. Yep. And then I'm going to create this top-level window with, with a given format. <laughs> okay, very simple enough. Second thing I'm going to do is manually create an OpenGL context, because nobody else is going to create that for me. I need to create one manually. I set the same format as I said before. I try to create it. If I fail, fatal. Otherwise, I can create it. Then I make this context current on the current window because I will need it 
soon. Then I'm going to create my custom renderer and initialize it. I can initialize it because I got an OpenGL context, so I can do that. I'm going to create this camera class, which simply wraps a camera position. And this is a setup that I need to do manually. And now, finally, I set up Qt Quick. So the way I set up Qt Quick is by creating that Qt Quick render control, and then creating that Qt Quick window that I need to keep around without ever showing it. Yep, and this Qt Quick window gets initialized by using the render control. Does it make sense? Yeah. Uh, I'm also going to disable the clear before rendering it because I want to render myself before Qt Quick. Uh, ignore this part for now. Yep. Uh, let's focus on this line here. So this, li this connect line here. Uh, says that every time the render control tells me that scene has changed, I need to perform the synchronization step. I need to tell Qt Quick, okay, you can synchronize. So for efficiency reasons, uh, I want to synchronize only once in a while. I don't want to synchronize every time every single property of my items change. So I batch this synchronization together by using a small timer. This, these five lines of code start a very short timer that is going to be used to batch these requests for synchronization together. Yeah? So basically, when the render control tells me that the scene has changed, I start this timer, and the timer will eventually perform the synchronization at the end. That's the reason of this block of code. Then I'm going to say that when Qt Quick wants to render itself as opposed as synchronize itself, I call the draw slot on this. Yeah? And finally, I can now initialize the render control itself, passing the context in. So this can set up the Qt Quick to render itself. All done? Well, no, not quite, because I've created everything. I haven't loaded my QML file yet. So I need to load some QML now. And again, I'm on my own. There is nothing to help me loading QML. So I don't know if you have ever loaded the QML scene manually, but it's not a pleasant job. You need to write some, quite some code. You need to write, uh, you need to create a QML engine. You need to set an incubation controller on that QML engine. <laughs> yeah. You need to load a component, which I'm going to do here. So I create a component. And since component loading is asynchronous, I need to listen to the changes status of this component. And finally, I can tell this component, please load some QML. <laughs> yep. Everything by hand. I get full control on what's happening, how it's happening, when it's happening. But on the other hand, with great power, great responsibility. I need to write all this code. Yep. So let's see. A okay, that's pretty much it. Let's see what happens in, in, in these lots that were connected from the signals coming from the Q Quick Render Control. In here, this is the call that basically gets, this is the, uh, the call coming from uh, the Qt Quick needs to synchronize. So what do I do is that I call these polish items yeah, that I was supposed to call. I once more copy data from the camera into the render. I perform again this kind of copy. And I call sync to perform the synchronization. OK? Does it make sense? Right. The other thing I need to, I need to do is that when the Qt Quick render control wants to render itself, I call draw on myself. So in this case, what I do is this. Inside draw, I make my context current on this. OK, fair enough. I set the viewport, because nobody did it, so I need to do it myself. Then I render um, my custom OpenGL code. Once, I'm, once more, I'm not going to touch that class. It does something. I clean up the OpenGL state, because Qt Quick wants a clean OpenGL state. And then I'm going to ask the render control to render Qt Quick. So since I'm doing things in this order, render my stuff, render Qt Quick, this once more is going to implement some sort of overlay. Yep. But I could have done anything I wanted. I could have, over here, I could have wrapped this call and redirected the rendering off screen into a texture or do whatever I want, really. Yep. And then post process the rendering or do some other fancy effect. After I've done all this, again, I'm on my own, so buffers. 
There's nothing swapping buffers for me. So all this rendering happened to a back buffer, and it does a buffer call to bring it to the screen. OK, so enough talking. That's basically the skeleton of it. Let me see if this actually works. And it does. It looks surprisingly like the first one we saw, but this is implemented in a totally different way. This is implemented uh, by custom drawing of everything, customly assembling all these pieces together. Yeah, so it still works. OK? All right. So I think I exposed everything. I thank you for your patience. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Yes? How can we check about... So can you wait for the microphone so that it goes on tape? <laughs> uh, so how can we check if it's uh, a single thread or multi-thread? How to just make sure? Programmatically, uh, when we run the oh, code? Okay, programmatically... Uh, well, you could just check in... Uh, you could connect to one of the Qt Quick window, uh, Qt Quick window signals and check in there if the thread is the same as the main thread. Okay. So you can do a check in there, and then you know for sure. Okay. You can check uh, using QThread current thread, which tells you what thread you're in, and you can compare that with your Q GUI application thread, which is by definition the main thread. If the two are the same, you're running monothreaded. If you are different, you have a render thread. I see. You can also choose in the sense that uh, if multi-threading gives you headaches, you can disable multi-threading forcibly and say, no, I want to run single-threaded because this is too much hassle. So uh, there are a couple of environment variables that you can set uh, in order to disable multi-threading in case you don't like that. Uh, the same can be used also to enable multi-threading, but you should never do so because if it's disabled, it's for good reasons, like you know, it's prone to crash on your particular system, so you should not enable it yourself. Okay? Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Um, could you also, could you please Hi. clarify one more time the whole pass? What happens if uh, uh, the redrawing of uh, render control is requested? You know, for example, we resized it and we need to. So then, what what happens? The the signals and slots that are called. Okay, case? so uh, are you asking in the last example what happens if I resize the window? Yes, okay, so. Um, the resize is pretty much manual. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that what's going to be resized is my window, which has nothing to do with Qt Quick. So I need to forward this information to Qt Quick in order to make it realize that its surface can be resized. And the way I do so is like this. So inside this code, where is the class? Okay, here. I, so this is a Q window. Q window itself has this resize event. Okay, so I override that. And in there, I call, okay, I call this a helper function, which is going to do this. Uh, it's going to change the width and height over a root item. Uh, what is this root item? This root item is something that uh, QQuick window has. So Q -quick, it's a kind of an implementation detail. Uh, your QQuick scene is going to have an invisible root item somewhere inside of it, and you can access it directly because this guy actually got set by here. It got set when you created uh, your component and you set your, your, your root item. So what you're going to do inside, up, when you get resize, this resize this invisible root item. That's what you're going to do. Uh, optionally, you can also ask it to redraw, but this is not actually a thing necessary because these two calls are going to issue a redraw anyhow because you now you just resize something in the scene and then you get a redraw call anyhow, so that's fine. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the way you do it, basically. Exactly. So once, once you do this, these will trigger calls to, I need to resynchronize, I need to redraw, Autom pretty much automatically. OK. Any more questions? Any more questions? Oh, one in the back there. I have a question about uh, frame buffer object, Qt Quick frame buffer yes. object, and the uh, related uh, renderer. So there is a synchronized function in the renderer. Yes. Yeah, I think it's called 
Only when update function is called from the frame buffer, cute quick frame buffer object. Yeah. Right? So right. Uh, do you know if there is a way to call it on every frame? <sighs> Why don't you call update every frame? Mm, just to pull some. Oh, yeah, data. Um, so the idea is, of course, it does not get called unless you say it needs to be called because Qtwig doesn't want to do uh, user's work. So it does not literally want to go ask everyone about uh, their own uh, rendering. It just goes to ask the objects that have marked themselves as dirty, and you mark an object as dirty by calling update. Uh, so I'm not totally sure about how to do it every frame. I mean, you could probably connect to one of the signals emitted from the window, like frame swapped or something like that, and cause that to dirty your atom. So the next frame needs to be repainted, and so your function gets called. You can work around that very, very easily. I don't know of a built-in way. It would be seem strange to me if there is a built-in way, but that's a workaround that works, so it should be, it should be easy. So this, um, this is a signal coming from a window, or? It's coming from QQuick window. Okay. So QQuick window has these signals over here, the ones that I discussed at the beginning, and you can easily connect to each one, for instance, frames warped. And you say, okay, after I'm done rendering a frame, mark this thing as dirty immediately. So you need a new frame to render it, and, and, and you get that. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Do we have any more questions? One over there, but plenty of questions. But we got all the time, guys, so don't worry. <laughs> well, yes, really, I'm the last one. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Just so, kidding, kidding, sorry. Hi. So my question might be semi-related to the previous one. So yes. in case of the solution number two, when my renderer actually, let's say, made my scene dirty in some way, the OpenGL scene, right? Yep. So you said I would have to call update from the GUI thread um, yes. in order to let's say, make the synchronization happen again and then for the renderer to run. Uh, so <laughs> what we did in our yeah, solution, we, let's say, issued a signal yeah, back to the GUI thread, it called update and yeah, magic happened. So this is, I believe, not the best way. Um, is there a better solution or we have to yeah, go to solution number three? Uh, and do everything by our own in that way. Uh, yeah, pretty much. I mean, uh, why did exactly? Sorry, I should not. I should not answer with another question. But why? What did it exactly fall apart? Because what you um, described seems uh, sensible. Um, imagine that I don't know um, something happened in the renderer, or um, that uh, yeah, we added a new element to to, to be drawn and yeah. You know, Something like that, but uh, um, not from the GUI thread. It happened on the on the renderer thread somehow. Right. So you can. So if you have your renderer thing emit a signal and you connect that signal to the update slot of your frame buffer object class, uh, that works. Uh, if you don't specify the connection type, it actually works because uh, it will be queued, it will yeah. be picked up on the GUI thread, and will just work. Yeah. So unless something major falls apart, uh, that that that's supposed to work. Uh, if you need to do something at a more finite grain, grain level of detail, you need solution number three. You need to okay. get in charge of everything. Thank you. You're welcome. More questions? Further questions? Two more? They Someone are increasing exponentially. <laughs> <laughs> Every time they double up. <laughs> and cool. There's one over here, are one over there. there? Okay. Sorry, can, can you say it in the microphone? Okay. The, the ugly thing that you said that you encapsulated with this, uh, that you yeah. didn't, can you just uh, give an example how ugly it is? It's not, oh, okay. it's not ugly, okay? <laughs> Let's clarify something. But, but it's like a black box. You know, I don't want to go in there and tear it apart and split it in 75 different classes. Uh, so this is the mesh render thing. Uh, it's, got, uh, okay. it's got, so the class itself is a key object and it's got a few buffers, GL buffers, a shader program, a VIO in there. Uh, the really interesting part are these three functions. So initialize to 
create it, to fully create the OpenGL objects. These are supposed to be called when the OpenGL context is active. Render, to render it, and invalidate, to invalidate it, so to destroy its resources, its OpenGL resources. Uh, initialize is going to do, so to create a, like an OBJ file and do a bunch of OpenGL code that loads normals, vertices, indices into the respective buffers. There's nothing special to that. It's going to create a shader program to compile it. Uh, in here, I'm leveraging the cute classes. But again, I'm not supposed to read this code, right? I'm supposed to know that this code does something with OpenGL. Uh, in this case, I'm just creating shaders, VAOs, buffers, whatever I want. Uh, the render function is going to, of course, render. So it sets up a few matrices. Yep. Blah, 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 blah. And in the end, it's going to call somewhere clear color, bind the shader program, set a bunch of uniforms, and draw a few triangles in the end. Yeah, so yep. it's doing something, okay? <laughs> yeah, it's simple, but it's uh, supposed to be something that I'm not going to see even, okay? As long as I can split logically, initialize, render, destroy, which is pretty much natural because anything does let, you need a, way, a point in time where you can create it, a point in time where you decide to render, a point in time when you want to destroy it, at least, yeah, uh, everything else in there can do anything it wants. Okay, so that's it, pretty much. Invalidate, yeah, destroy a few OpenGL resources. Does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> um, let's say I would want to limit uh, for my application, could quick application, uh, the frame rate to some constant. So is the only way to implement this could quick render, or there are some other options for me? Uh, yes, uh, so there is so that there, there is one other option which is much much simpler. Uh, but uh, a word of advice, which is this: uh, if nothing is changing in the scene, your frame rate is going to be zero, because QtWeek does not just render itself all the time because it's pointless. It will just burn your CPU and battery, and that's bad, right? Uh, so the way you can do that, if you really want to see a solid 60 frame per s FPS in the corner or something like that, uh, it's again by simply uh, connect to one of these signals, again, frame swapped is pretty much indicated, connect a slot to that, and take your measurement every time that signal gets emitted. Okay, but, but I don't want to measure it, I want to limit it. Oh, so limit it? Yes, yes. Oh, sorry, 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 I understood the other way, sorry. Uh, so, limit it, yes, third way. Okay. Yes. Otherwise, for QtWeek 2 renders every time it wants to, which may be too much. So, yes. That's the case. Thank right. you. You're welcome. Sorry, I understood the measure it, not uh, not limit it. Yeah. Anyone else? Any more? Okay. So. Otherwise, I'm just going to say thank you. Thank you very much again. <laughs> <laughs>